So in this particular presentation, we're going to have a little introduction to a special PDE, partial differential equation, called the heat equation. And we're going to derive the heat equation. Okay? Okay, so a little bit of history first. Um, in the early 1800s, a French mathematician called um, Fourier studied the flow of heat or heat flux. And one of the motivations for this was that if we um, have a deeper understanding of heat flow, then um, the ideas can be translated to um, various uh, parts of science, uh, engineering, and, and industry. Now, Fourier's analysis led to the following um, uh, set of problems. Now, you can think of you, uh, well, essentially, it, we've got, let, let's look at what we've got first. We've got a partial differential equation. By the subscripts here, I mean just the derivative, partial derivatives, right? So u sub x is du dx, u sub t would be du dt, uh, u sub x, x would be d squared u dx squared. Okay, so on the left hand side here, we've got a partial differential equation, alpha is some constant. In the middle, we've got some sort of boundary conditions. And on the right hand side, um, this is known as like a, a, an initial temperature uh, function. Okay, so um, x in this case is given by, uh, it, it denotes a position, and t represents time. Now we'll talk a little bit more about it, uh, how, how this. Um, um, PDE comes about in, in a little bit, but just, just um, consider that problem just for a moment. Now, Fourier performed his analysis and he came up with the following solution form. Okay? Now, on a first glance, that looks quite complex. It is. All right. It's an infinite sum involving an exponential, a sine function, and a sequence of constants, B sub n. For his analysis relied on the following assumption, that F could be, the initial, the initial temperature could be written as a sum possibly an infinite sum, of sine functions. Okay, so as we'll see today, we'll walk a few steps in Fourier's shoes. A question here is, when can you express some given function as an infinite sum, a possibly infinite sum of sine functions? Hmm. So this led Fourier to develop a whole new approach called Fourier series. And it actually took about 20 or 30 years for Fourier's ideas to be accepted by uh, various uh, communities. So I think he developed these ideas in around 1805, but they weren't really accepted until about, eight, I think, between 1820 and 1830. Okay, so we are going to derive the heat equation in one dimension, uh, just, just a real simple analysis. Okay? So, suppose that we have a thin bar or a thin rod of length big L uh, wrapped around the x-axis. And in particular, the ends of the rod or the bar will lie at these positions. So if I wanted to draw a little picture here. I would 
draw something like this. Okay, suppose this is the x-axis, the horizontal axis here. The ends are at x equals 0 and x equals big L. And let's assume that the bar or the rod under consideration is uh, made of homogeneous material, is straight and has uniform cross-sections. So by uniform cross-sections, I mean you can see in this picture, if I slice the bar sort of um, perpendicular to the x-axis, I'll always get disks or circles. Okay. Now we also make an assumption that the sides of the bar are perfectly insulated. So you can think about, in this picture here, think about the, um, the bar being wrapped in a sleeve. Okay. So these um, ends are not wrapped, but there's a sort of a, you know, think of, think of encasing the, the um, sides of the bar in some sleeve, if you like. Okay, and in particular, one of our assumptions with this insulation is that no heat passes through um, that, that um, insulated side or sides. Okay, well, because we're considering thin bars or rods, you can think of this profile here, this cross section. If this is very thin compared to, the, say, the length of the rod, the temperature is not going to vary very much on that shaded region. So the temperature, say, here is going to be the same as the temperature over here. All right? So in particular, since our bar is thin, the temperature can be considered as constant on any given cross-section. So if I'm at, say, <coughs> some point along the x-axis and I draw a, a cross-section in, the temperature along that cross-section is constant and it's just a function of uh, x. So ultimately our function, temperature function u, is a, position, a function of position x and time t. Now you can get more complicated expressions but this is the simple a one-dimensional um, heat, equa uh, heat equation setup that we're going to use. You can look at he heat flow in two and three dimensions, but we're just starting very basic here. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to show how to form this heat equation. Now the alpha squared, the squared's here just for convenience. You don't, it doesn't have, doesn't have to be squared. But the alpha is some constant that depends on the material of the bar in question. Okay, so under our assumptions, where does this PDE come from then? Well, let's consider some section of our bar or our rod. So just consider a sort of a subsection, if you like. Okay, and so suppose the ends are like at x0 and x1. Okay, call that, that region of the bar, say, big D. Now, if you want to calculate the total amount of heat at time t in this region, it's just the integral of this. Okay. Now, C here, is, we're assuming C is constant. It's the specific heat of the material, and rho is the density of the material. So you multiply that through by the temperature function, and you integrate from one end of the bar to the other. 
Okay? Now, if you take this expression and differentiate it with respect to t, you can form a derivative, dh dt. Now, using Leibniz rule, remember, you just differentiate both sides and then push the d dt inside the integral sign and change the straight d's to curly d. So you're taking a partial derivative. Now the c and the row are constant, so they can come out the front of the integral sign. Okay, so that's one expression for um, the rate of um, uh, heat changing with respect to time in this in this d. Okay. Well, what we're going to do is come up with another representation for dh dt, and then set them to be equal. Now, this, this second part involves um, a law of heat flow called Fourier's law. All right, well, under our assumptions, the sides of the bar are insulated, so the only way that heat can flow in or out of D is through this side, okay, through the ends, so to speak. Now, Fourier introduced the following um, law of heat flow. Fourier said that heat flows from hot regions to cold regions, okay? And the flow rate is proportional to this derivative. Now, if we were in high dimensions here, you would have um, uh, d divergence um, in there. But for basic one-dimensional flow, this partial derivative is fine, u sub x. OK, well, the net rate of change of heat h in our little region d is just the rate at which heat enters D minus the rate at which heat leaves D. Okay, so if you look at, say, the um, flow over this and this, say, um, the, um, the rate at which heat enters D, say, from left to right, we come up with this term. Okay, and similarly, along, over this boundary, or this edge, you can come up with this term here. Now we've got minus signs in there, there and there, because there'll be a flow from left to right if and only if the temperature, say at x naught, on this side is greater than the temperature on this side. Okay? In that case, it means that this derivative will be negative. Okay? You can make a similar argument for this case as well. Now, the kappa here is just the um, thermal conductivity constant. Okay, well, we've got, uh, if we can simplify this, I can form this, and then I can um, use the fundamental theorem of calculus to sort of um, write this as the integral of, of this second order partial derivative. So now what we've got is two expressions for dh dt. Okay? So, if I let my two expressions for dh dt be equal, then I come up with the boxed expression, and let's just differentiate with respect to x sub 1. Again, using the fundamental theorem of calculus, I'll get something like this. Okay? So if I just rearrange those constants, I've actually got this now. Okay? Now since the argument works for um, all intervals from x0 to x1 and for all t uh, positive, it follows that the above PDE is satisfied for our interval of interest. In other words, the um, interval that our bar um, covers and also all positive time t. Okay, well, um, the PDE 2 
um, is, essentially describes some sort of physical uh, balance. The rate at which heat flows into any, of the por any portion of the bar is equal to the rate at which heat is absorbed into that portion of the bar. And as a result, the two terms in this PDE2 are sometimes referred to as the absorption term, this one here, and the flux term, this one here. 